All right, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, my name is Mike Callahan with AWS, and uh, with me, which is more awkward because they're in the audience, kind of, <laughs> is uh, Kunal Ramchandani uh, from Nine and uh, Lloyd Wallace from uh, BBC. We're going to talk through a few different ways that broadcasters are moving their live streaming um, onto AWS and some of the challenges that they're that they're facing. Um, but I'll start uh, a little bit ahead of that with why are they doing this? What's happening? Um, and one of the one of the big challenges that the industry has right now is that traditionally the broadcast chain looked similar to this, where rights holders. Um, sent content to the broadcast channels, sent content to the distributors, and they talked to the customers. But over the last few years, especially with the evolution of, of over-the-top broadcasting, what we've seen is that the, all of these different players in the market are able to talk directly to the customer. And this, this means that people have a lot more, people as consumers have a lot more opportunity to pick the um, viewing experience that fits them the best. And what this means is that each of the individuals that want to talk to that customer, uh, that end consumer, have to really plan out the way that they want to do that. They have to provide the best experience um, because the customers have a choice now. They can change w which provider they're viewing if they get a bad experience, um, if they find a provider that has better user experience, or if it's sports, they're looking for stats on the screen at the same time as their video. All of those types of experiences can start playing into the user experience now. And what, um, what, what we believe is that the cloud is, is what allows everyone to be able to reach these customers, to give them the ability to, to place shift, watch, watch programs wherever they want, um, provides them the quality and the reliability, and the ability to personalize the content. So um, one of the sets of tools that are available for this are the media services through AWS. And um, we have a huge focus on um, providing the highest quality, providing very strong resiliency, um, reliability, and scalability. And I'll cover some of these points kind of towards the end. Um, but for now, what I'd like to do is have um, uh, Kunal come up and talk through uh, kind of Nine's experience and how they've moved some of their work onto AWS and uh, how that transition has gone and, and kind of just general, the, the overall flow for live streaming. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I think half the audience is people I know, so this is good. Um, so I'm Kunal Ramchandani. I am the Digital Development Director at Nine. Uh, now, for those who don't know who or what we are, um, Nine Entertainment on Nine is one of Australia's largest media organizations. In fact, I think in a couple of weeks, we'll officially be Australia's largest media organization. Um, the history of television and the history of Nine is pretty closely intertwined. Um, on, at 7 p.m. on September 16, 1956, Nine sent out its first ever broadcast, and with that, commercial television in Australia was born. Good evening, and welcome to television. From Channel 9 comes the first television program in Australia. Station TCN presents This is Television. That, that was the first ever broadcast. Um, and, and we complain about not having enough to watch on TV nowadays. So today, things are very different, as you'd imagine. Um, but at our core, we've tried to stay the same. Our strategy has always been very simple, is to create great content, distribute it broadly, and engage our audiences and advertisers. As the home of Australia's most loved and trusted brands, spanning news, where we reach over 11.5 million viewers, that's roughly half the population. Sport, where last year we had four out of the top six sporting events on nine. Lifestyle, where we're currently the home of Australia's leading women's lifestyle network. And entertainment, where nine is the home of Australia's most loved shows, both homegrown and international. Um, shows like The Voice, Australian Ninja Warrior, 
uh, Married at First Sight, Love Island, The Block, and the list goes on and on. Our digital platforms reach about 71% of the online population in Australia, um, and our streaming and catch-up service, Nine Now, accounts for 49% of all long-form minutes and 35% of all live stream minutes in a month, which is all of which sort of makes my job quite interesting, never boring. So living at the intersection of Australia's best content, conversation and culture, Nine is where Australia connects. Keeping in mind that you aren't here to hear me go on and on about my company, let's get down to the actual talk. So while we've been broadcasting since about 1956, as I mentioned, uh, and we've innovated a fair bit in that space, we only really started live streaming our channels about two years ago. Um, when we started live streaming, um, we, we didn't actually own the rights to a lot of the shows that people wanted to watch, which left us with a very interesting uh, experience for users because they would come in, they would log in, and they would get ready for their show, and then we'd be forced to show them a blank slate. Now, naturally, this led to a lot of sort of user complaints, and we were able to take that and then go back to our, uh, the rest of the business and say, look, we need to change the way we currently do our rights, and we need to, we need to change the strategy. So as things started, things were a little slow, but as we got rights to better content, sporting events like rugby, um, the golf, um, things like the Oscars, um, and then the shows that I mentioned previously, things started taking off. So here's what our numbers look like over the last two years. So as you can see, at the start, we were only doing a few thousand streams a month, um, and then we had a peak of about five million there a few months ago, and the last few months we've been averaging about four million. The peak was quite interesting because that was driven by two main shows. There was a, a rugby event known as State of Origin for any Aussies in the room. That's, that's a, a pretty big event once a year. And the second one was a, live, a reality TV show called Love Island. Now, I can't believe I'm actually talking about Love Island, um, but <laughs> it, it was quite interesting because the company went with a strategy of trying to attract sort of a younger audience, a 16 to 24 age group, um, which, which we did. But what we didn't anticipate was the number of people that actually watched that show on our live streaming platform versus on linear TV. 15 episodes of Love Island had a higher viewership on, on our platform than on linear TV, which is, which is pretty phenomenal. And it remains Nine's most viewed non-sport event to date, which is pretty cool. So there you go. Job well done. We can all go home now. Well, not quite. This would be a very short talk if that was the case. So, Here's what our infrastructure to support that live streaming looked like. Um, we, have, we took our, our feed from the broadcast room, sent that to a Teradek encoder. That would then get sent to our data center, where it'd have to be decoded, sent to a TriCaster, where someone could connect and append or edit metadata to it. That would then get sent to a Spinnaker encoder, get re-encoded, finally get an HLS stream that gets sent to a CDN, before finally getting to the player. Lots of hardware, lots of potential points of failure, um, and, and as you can imagine, as sort of the stress on these boxes increased and as the uptake increased, so did some of the issues. Now, I, I do want to clarify, the, the setup itself wasn't the issue because the setup actually did what it needed to do. The problem is, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of you in this room have a similar problem, is when you have a lean team, you don't really have the luxury to deep dive into a lot of the problems that you have. Especially when, in true IT style, 90% of these issues are fixed with a simple reboot. Now, that left me with unhappy consumers because their streams were dropping during events that they really wanted to see. But it also left me with unhappy devs because I'm getting calls at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., streams down, someone needs to get up, reboot the boxes, and on and on. So it became very obvious that this isn't something that we could sustain longer term. We needed to do something about it. Um, enter AWS. So now at this point, we'd already been four or five years into our digital transformation journey for those playing buzzword bingo. Um, and we've been throwing everything we could at the cloud successfully. And when Amazon announced media services uh, at a previous reInvent, we had a look at it and said, look, let's have a look at this, see if there's something we can use, and see if this, this solves some of our problems. So we brought them in. We had a long meeting with them. Um, and this is what we came up with at the end of that meeting. As you can see, it's a lot simpler. We changed some of the boxes from pink to black. We added some nice logos to it, and problem solved. Well, on a more serious note, um, we now get, we, we have a Wirecast box. We get the stream from our broadcast. The uh, producers can add or append metadata straight away. We then send that through to, to the cloud, um, to Media Live. Media Live converts it to HLS straight away. 
That gets then sent to media store, where it's ready for CloudFront and out to the player. I should also mention that this entire proof of concept was set up within 40 minutes. By the time they actually walked out of the room, we were ready to stream live. Now, knowing that this was going to be a proof of concept, and, and as I'm sure most of you have this experience, if a, if a proof of concept is successful, it's live. There is, you're not given a chance to change it. So we thought, let's just take a step back and, and productionize it just a little bit. So we set up a bit of a pipeline to, to deploy changes through to, um, to the new setup. Devs, um, we, we didn't want sort of our, uh, our um, DevOps team to be the, the roadblock, so we, we set this up so that devs could push config changes out themselves. Devs push their code through to Stash. We use Team City for our CI and CD. That then goes through and pushes uh, using the APIs that Amazon have provided for Media Live and Media Store. We push those changes through, and then we use CloudFormation and CF templates to push changes through for CloudFront. It's a fairly simple setup. Now, this setup works really, really well when you're pushing config changes out. Where this setup does not work so well is when you are deploying the new end-to-end -end setup. Because you've actually got to deploy Media Live first, get settings from it, put that into Media Store, get settings from it, put that into CloudFront. So if anyone's actually solved that problem or has a better way of deploying this end-to-end -end first up, come and have a chat with me after this, or find me on all the different social networks, I would love to talk to you. Um, so yeah, this went live. It, we ran this as, as a split stream, so we had the old infrastructure running, we had the new infrastructure running. We used it um, for news initially, um, just to see what the numbers looked like, and it was a lot more stable, as expected. And I suddenly had much happier devs. Sidetracking slightly, how awesome is sort of um, these images, because that was like hours of work of just wasting time finding images from the internet. <laughs> Unless my boss is listening to this, in which case I was working really hard while doing this. Um, yeah, so I had happy devs again. This also gave us the ability to actually concentrate on some QoS metrics. Uh, any people, in any, any, anyone here use Mux? Cool, so a few people here. So we use Mux for our, our uh, QoS metrics. And uh, I would have loved to have actually put the MUX graphs up there, but because we were starting and stopping streams and swapping between A and B, MUX looked at the downtime as an outage and would sort of penalize you going, this, your stream was down for this period. So I had to actually take those numbers and, and extrapolate these out for you. Um, so what we, we started looking at, and we saw that playback success, which is the number of playbacks without errors, improved. Um, our startup time, which is time to first frame, improved. Uh, smoothness, which is the lack of rebuffering in a, in a player, that improved and video quality, which is the amount of upscaling and downscaling required to fill uh, a video player, um, also improved. And for the bean counters, the all important metric for them, cost actually went down, which really shouldn't be a surprise since we got rid of a whole bunch of boxes um, and swapped them with, with um, the black ones that I showed you previously. So now I had happier consumers, happier devs, and also a happy boss, which left me pretty happy. Um, so yeah, so where to from here? Well. We're now looking at what we can do with this or how we can extend this further down the chain. Um, where we're seeing great benefit of this is in ad hoc and pop-up live events. Any tennis fans in the room? A couple. Um, so Nine's gonna be the home of tennis for, uh, home of tennis, um, for the next five or six years in Australia. And contractually, we have to show 16 courts, which is where the Australian Open takes place. Now, the match only takes place a few weeks in a year. It just does not make sense to go down and invest in all that infrastructure for 16 courts that I'm only going to use for a couple of weeks in the year. So something like this is really, really useful because it gets us a speed to market without outlaying huge amounts of cash. And that's that. Hopefully, I've sort of given you a short sort of insight into our journey with, uh, with Media Live and Media Services. And uh, I think next is Lloyd, who's going to talk about what they're doing at BBC with the monitoring. Thank you. Hi, um, so my name is Lloyd Wallace. I'm a senior engineer working in the BBC's platform team and we try and build reusable components for all of our online streaming, uh, all of our online products from news to the BBC iPlayer, our flag on-demand catch-up service in the UK, as well as BritBox, a service in, a subscription VOD service in the US and Canada. The BBC is quite a bit older than me. I'm not, I haven't been around for a lot of its story, um, but this video should give you a brief a kind of overview about what its journey has been like so far. This is the British Broadcasting Company calling. 
The station goes on the air. Television broadcast for the first time. The first outside broadcast of the Olympic Games. The coronation service witnessed by millions. The first live round the world telecast. The Beatles. The first colour television programme in Europe. You can keep abreast of the latest news with CFAX, meaning CFAX. Now, computers are getting to be very, very commonplace. The BBC puts computers in schools. The greatest day of rock the world's ever known. Today, apparently, we launched our website. BBC iPlayer, making the unmissable... Truly unmissable. We're giving you complete control of what you want to watch and when you want to watch it. Let's go! From restarting a live programme to a VR walk in space. From broadcasting Six Nations Rugby live into orbit to putting coding in schools. We've been bringing you the future since 1922. BBC, where next? Internet technology will bring us infinite viewing possibilities. Scaled for millions. Tailored to you. Experience the shows you love like never before. The future holds many exciting possibilities. Whenever I watch that, I feel like the presenter who said that computers are starting to become really quite commonplace, possibly under kind of understated what was going to happen. Uh, so the, the other thing about that video is that it starts really slowly. We, in 1922, we did our first radio broadcast, and later on these pictures came along, and then, and then colour was invented later. And, and then it just starts moving faster and faster. And so that covers most of the 90 and a bit years that BBC has been running around, been around for, but over the last decade is kind of where we've really been moving online. And, and, and that's what I want to focus on about our journey so far in that land. To start off in 2010, we did our first HTTP media delivered stream. Before that, uh, this was a time when Flash was still the future. Um, our streams before this for RTMP, Real Media, Windows Media, and so we used Adobe HDS, and that was when we first were able to do that live restart capability. In 2011, as part of the BBC's plan to try and be more, well, less London centric and, and get, get more content from around the UK, we we released three new office buildings up in Manchester in the northwest of England, and BBC Sports was one of the departments to move up there. We knew that there was an Olympics coming. They happen every four years. And this one was actually hosted in the UK as well, so we knew this was going to be a very important one for us. We called it our first digital Olympics. And as part of this, we went, well, sport are going to want to probably do a few things, so a few channels. So as part of that build-out, they were given a gallery that let them run six additional TV stations for the duration of the Olympics on broadcast, and 24 online. To do that, back then, this was for every two online channels, we bought a nice 4U Elemental encoder box, a long, long time before Amazon bought them, before bought Elemental. And so there was just a whole rack just of these encoders. But it worked. The Olympics happened. It was a success. And then we, we kind of stepped back. And we thought, OK, when we built this out, we didn't think the cloud was ready yet. It was kind of exciting and new. And as a broadcaster, we care more about a strong and stable infrastructure. And so now we looked again and looked at one of the interesting problems we have around the iPlayer on-demand platform. A lot of our content is delivered ahead of time, back then with tape. So that was fine. But our flagship channel, BBC One, is normally one channel. Um, in the evenings, it becomes four channels, one for England, one for Scotland, one for Wales, and one for Northern Ireland. And for two 15 to 30 minute periods a day, it becomes 18 different channels as they all do their local news bulletins. And that meant that we wanted the capacity to quickly encode the on-demands for 18 news bulletins for a very short period of time. And we'd heard of this cloud thing. And so we tried it out and we bought some contribution encoders. Um, they were from Harmonix and built this, uh, this another box that took the on-premise live streams and created a HLS stream that we could then put into Amazon. Then we used the Elemental Cloud on-demand encoding product that then just scaled up and down in response to those events. The other constraint we had with our on-premise encoding is we only had enough for about 30 to 40 hours of HD content a week. So as well as news suddenly being available right away, we suddenly overnight went from 
some HD content to some SD content. And so the, the quality of experience for, for users, whether they watch news or anything else, really went up as well. So that was 2013. And then in 2014, we realized we, we built, built this box that took our live streams, shut channels, and then put them into the cloud. So we should probably do something with that. Um, and so we looked at what we would do with the online streams of BBC One, BBC Two, and all of our other simulcast channels. We still bought some physical elemental encoders for that, but we moved everything after that up into the cloud. And that's kind of what we're running on now. Obviously, hardware has an age of about five years, so we're now talking about, we're going to refresh it again, what's it going to be in 2019? To give you a bit more idea about the scale of the channels that we run, the BBC has 33 online 24-7 TV channels that are copies on its broadcast, and then various departments between news, sports, uh, parliaments, all have the ability to run online-only event streams. There's also radio. We do a lot more radio than we do TV as well. There's 166 radio stations that we've found so far. Uh, the BBC does a lot of local radio. Uh, we recently came across BBC Radio Orkney. Uh, Orkney is uh, an island off the coast of Scotland that's actually closer to Norway, but we've got a radio station there. Um, and we found that recently and that they were putting their on demand on, onto SoundCloud. So we thought we'd, we've got a thing for this. Um, so, so we're still finding new ones every once in a while, but we think we've got them all now. And then, of course, pop-up events services as well, so online radio-only events. So that's, this is largely physical, unfortunately, today, but all of our radio is cloud-based encoding, and we're not buying new hardware encoders for our events, as that 60-plus number was about, probably about 40 a couple of months ago. During the World Cup this summer, as with nine, the, um, summer this year was set new records for us. In that day, we streamed about 3.6 million hours of live content to our users during the Sweden versus England match, and that worked out as a peak of the UK, on the UK internet of about 5.5 terabits per second of streaming. When you think about the UK, you need to remember that it's quite small. I believe uh, there was a CDN that mentioned that uh, there was an Indian broadcaster recently that, that had set new records, and I was looking at, and I read that and. It wasn't a lot. It, it was a lot more than what we were doing, but considering the number, the, the size of the country and the number of people there versus the UK, we, we, we felt that we were doing quite well there. there. And the other thing about that number is the reason it was 5.5 terabits per second is because we ran out. Uh, so this was our first summer where we were doing UHD streams. We had two online-only UHD channels. This was the first time where we said something that we're broadcasting. If you watch it online, it's actually going to be better. So that was quite exciting for us. But we limited it to around 60,000 users at a time just to make sure that we were able to deliver a good enough quality of service to users in the UK. One of the interesting things about one of the matches I remember is being told that there was a little bit more capacity available in the UK as long as we gave it back by around 7.30 p.m. for a fortnight update. So I've mentioned that a lot of our encoders right now are physical boxes in data centers but there's a lot more that we have around them to run them. So there's the content delivery networks that I was just talking about. We use multiple commercial CDN providers for our big live peaks, and we also, for on-demand, have our own CDN called Biddy. We then have a event control product that is used by the operators in the gallery, so their vision mixing, sound opping, but also starting and stopping the online events and managing metadata around them. We then have a set of systems that are monitoring what is going on with those streams and provide operational kind of interactions with them that are presented to our network, the engineers in our network operations center. Uh, we also have a playback mediation service, so this checks when a user attempts to play a stream, whether they are entitled to play it, and then suggests what the best CDNs are for that time, for that user, based on where they are, time of day, and kind of various other metrics. And then, of course, we then get the real-time user monitoring information back from that playback client, and that data then feeds back into the operations center as well to make decisions. So all of those boxes are indeed cloud-based products. We, so yeah, our coders aren't there yet, but everything else pretty much is. I'm going to talk to you in a bit more detail about the event control and monitoring boxes today. So first of those is monitoring. The big, issue with, uh, <laughs> the big issue with monitoring 
is that we buy a lot of boxes, as I mentioned before, and that they're from different vendors. So when you want to create a unified view about what's going on, you, you, you're not going to have one vendor and then another vendor provide you with the same metrics in the same form in a nice, easy to consume format. And so as it goes through each of those pieces, we wanted to provide a simple view of what was going on so that we could actually act on it. And we did. It looked a bit like this. Um, obviously not the pinnacle of beautiful web design, but you can see that there's the two encoder changes, chains and the two packager changes for each channel there. Um, and it, yes, it is always green, if you're wondering. Um, so to achieve this, we built a set of microservices we call the status polars. Uh, for example, status polar elemental. And this is an EC2 service where every 30 seconds, it goes and asks every elemental encoder and every channel running on every elemental encoder, how are you, what, what, what input are you currently doing, what output is it, are you doing, are you, are you dropping any frames, is everything okay? And then it creates a state document of everything that that piece of equipment is doing, sends a sample of these onto a topic that is then archived into a Splunk instance, and then the fire hose of all of the events that are happening all the time then goes into our Simulcast console component. So putting that together, it looks a little bit like this. Um, one of the questions you might want to ask is around, the, is around the topic and queue format when Kinesis streams exist. Back when we built this, uh, Kinesis streams had just, to, uh, had just been launched. And also, when we built our on-demand workflow, that was all SNS and SQS based. So we, went, we understand this. We've actually built tooling around building queue-based components. So we just went, we'll stick with that. The other thing that you might ask today is, could these all be lambdas? And the answer is probably yes. And we are looking at that as well as part of our refresh. And those state documents, here's an example of one of them from one of the services that we have called HLS RTP. So for our radio services, we take those HLS streams that we capture um, from our data centers, and then we, we get it up into AWS, and then we convert it back into RTP once it's in Amazon's network for online on onward encoding. So here, this is for BBC Radio Somerset, and it's currently and the input ID there is BBC Radio Somerset. So it's BBC Radio Somerset's the output. It's capturing the BBC Radio Somerset source from the A, i.e. primary capture source. Um, and then there's various other metadata about the RTP timestamps and latency that just kind of give you an idea that, that everything is working today. So the next part of this is our event control process. We call, we call this service Marvin. It's named after um, the robot from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's a loose play on words um, from, from his fairly well-known quote, don't talk to me about life. Um, don't talk to me about life instead, but I don't think it made sense because that's exactly what it's for. So with a Simulcast TV channel, they run all the time. So they're really easy. You, you just hit start, and in theory, you never touch them again because, like I said, that, that console's always green. Um, but with, with a webcast, as we call our event streams internally, there's a start and there's an end. So the happy path for one of these events is that you'll go and schedule this event uh, as the person who said, oh, we're going to, we're going to cover this football match. And you'll, you'll book your circuits, uh, video circuits, in, uh, up into the gallery in, in Manchester. And then when you, when you hit start in Marvin, it will start playing an MP4 loop saying there's a stream coming soon. Once you're happy that that source is safe to go out to air online, you then hit another button that then switches to taking the live input as its source and putting it out. Then Marvin, in theory, sits back. Everything works. Uh, your stream goes on for half an hour, 14 hours. I think 20 is probably the longest we've done. And then when, you, when it's finished, you hit an end button. For a couple of minutes, it's another looping MP4 just saying that, yeah, this, 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 there's nothing to see here now. You can move along. After that, Marvin shuts down the encoder, shuts down the packager, uh, triggers our on-demand process to go and create the VOD asset of that stream. And then once it's sure that the VOD asset's um, finished, it then releases that encoder and package pair to, to run another event. This is, as I mentioned, the happy, the happy path. There are more pieces to it as well. Um, it, um, when you think about failure modes, we've got to figure out how to get back to where things should be. But the nice thing about it, if you look at it, is it's a fairly understood flow. You know where you are and where you want to be. So to implement this, we have a service called the Marvin Encoder Manager. The status polars that I mentioned earlier, they are creating a state document of what the encoder is currently doing, what the package is currently doing. 
the Marvin UI for user interactions and schedules is then providing what state things should be in. So whenever a user says that this should now be in this state, the encoder manager then understands via a state machine how to transition from what the encoder is currently doing to what the encoder should be doing. We do this using three Dynamo DB tables, the status polar and the encoder manager component I mentioned as well. So every time the status polar uh, gets an update from Elemental Live, when, right, when it's dealing with a Marvin stream, it also, as well as sending the, the states on Simulcast console, it also writes that state into a Dynamo DB table. Then from a Dynamo stream, we get an, a notification to the encoder manager that's told this actual state's changed. This could mean something's fine, but it compares with the target state of what it should be, and if they don't match, it does something. Uh, an example of this is if the encoder does decide to stop, um, which has happened sometimes, or if the input has fallen down to its observed input, it might try and it will try and reactivate the primary input. Um, in an elemental live in encoder, you have a source, set of sources, and if one fails, it can fail over to the next. So what we have is the, the coming up slate at the top, then the live input, then a, a interrupted something's gone wrong slate. So what then happens is if you've gone to say interrupted slate, it's just constantly trying to move back to live source as soon as that's safe to go, as soon as it's working again. Um, one of the uh, cases we've had where the stream has stopped is uh, because our operations team were aware that we'd had an alarm, that there was no sound coming out of one of our streams. Um, so hit stop on the encoder. It turned out that the stream was fine. It was a live stream from a service run in the UK called Country File, every, um, so, uh, Spring Watch rather. And, it, and we put cameras in interesting places where nature is happening, you know, in birdhouses and things like that. So what the alert actually was is that the rabbit had left its burrow. But still, the, the encoder manager saw that something was wrong, that the stream had been stopped incorrectly, put it back in service, and then everything was fine. That third DynamoDB table there, we're then simply using as distributed locking. So we've got a fleet of those encoder manager instances, and we just make sure that only one is acting on the elemental at a time. So that's what we built today. We put, this is version two of Marvin, uh, we put it live immediately after the Rio Olympics in 2016. So that was the last major event we ran with Marvin 1, which was the on-premise version of this before we were, we, we were building cloud-based technologies, and that was really creaking. But we've built this now. It's running like I said, more than double the streams that the old on-premise one did with, with no extra work on, it, on our part whatsoever. So where next, I guess, is I've mentioned 2019 is our next point. And so we're thinking about what we need to do there. The first of those is that Simulcast console page I showed you earlier. It, it's not all that automated. I mentioned that issue earlier where an operations engineer incorrectly went and tried to fix a stream that was working. Uh, that thing is either green or, well, it's always green as I keep saying, but if it goes red, there's not a service there for most of our channels going, Someone needs, this just needs to be kicked, this needs to be restarted, or, you can, or just fail over to the backup until someone looks at it. It just goes red and says, human, can you please see what's going on? And we are trying to look forward to the future where we turn off those, those transmitters that we started building in 1922. It's a couple of decades away yet. We're not where, where nine is, where they've started having events where there are more people watching online than there are on broadcast. We haven't had that yet. But we're preparing for that. And, and really, to be comfortable, comfortable and with that, we need to make sure that we, we have five nines availability. And we can't expect a human to fix something in the fraction of a second that requires. So we want to extend this Marvin architecture that we built and apply it to our simulcast and a lot more of the failure modes than we currently have. Uh, so one of the, so, so if there's a latency alarm saying there's no, no video input for a while, fail over to the backup and then restart the primary and then fail back when it's all fine. Uh, we want to start automating a lot more of that and extend that state machine into a lot more complex situations. The other one is, I, I mentioned these boxes that we have. I know this is a cloud conference, but there's a fixed pool of them. And that's meant that Mar that means that Marvin today doesn't have to deal with scaling encoders. Uh, all of the new one services we spun up recently are cloud-based encoders. So it's now reaching the point where we're actually running Elemental Live encoders in the cloud 24 seven, just because we haven't built the management around the scaling capability. We're also now starting to, to take out those physical encoders. So it's, we're now at the point where, uh, so the tennis example, before we have the same thing with an event called Wimbledon, where for about one day a year, we run, we run 24 sports streams at once. 
And if we're going to start moving those into cloud, we need to start actually scaling that. And so we, we want to start when, when Marvin gets a scheduled event and it knows it's going to happen in the next 15 minutes, then it will start up the encoder and it will start up the packager, line everything up, and then actually tear down the resources when they're finished instead of there being a fixed pool that it releases and allocates to another event. And the other thing is that, as mentioned, we're using a mixture of physical elementals and also Elemental Live in the cloud, which is not the Elemental Media Services products yet. We've been talking to AWS Elemental since, since the acquisition about what the product looks like, and we are keeping an eye on it. There's a lot of new features that are coming out, that have come out and are on the way that are getting us increasingly excited about it and increasingly at the point where we're saying, let's start moving our workloads over to it. Uh, Media Connect, as you may have seen announced earlier this week as well, the other bit of physical boxes we have is that thing that we said that we built that, that gets things out into the cloud, and that's currently a thing that we build and maintain ourselves, and it's really quite, quite, quite rickety for what it is. And so the ability to send uh, Zix URTP fec straight up as well is, is quite exciting for us. Um, so we're looking at that. Um, Media Live as well, as I mentioned. So there's features that have been added in September, such as image insertion, synchronized pipelines, and input switching that get us to the point where we think we can run, we can run this and it will work just as well as our on-premise encoders. So we're testing all that out again, and we are hoping to move out to it soon. Um, so that's everything I have to say. I'm going to hand back over to Mike to, to put those pieces together. Thank you, Lloyd. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so the workflows, um, hey, oh, I'm pushing the laser button again. Uh, the workflows that uh, we just talked through all generally look, I mean, they generally look the same. They start with a contribution encoder, move to distribution encoding, uh, in this case, Media Live in the cloud, then onto an origin packaging product like Media Package, and then finally CloudFront for the end, end consumer um, deliverable. And the challenges here are to, to bring the the same types of capabilities and functionality that companies like Nine and BBC are require for their on-premises products, but allow them to, to do the same types of workflows in the cloud. Um, and it's, it's not as uh, simple as just spinning up an encoder, for example, with Media Live. So Media Live has a, a pretty complicated um, architecture that splits, um, splits encoders across uh, availability zones, which essentially means that every time you create a new channel with Media Live, you're actually using two different data centers. You're using two different availability zones. Usually, this is a little bit behind the scenes um, because we try and make things simple for people. Um, but to to give a little bit more detail about the architecture um, and what what's really happening behind the scenes, I think it makes sense to kind of talk through some of those pieces. Um, and as Lloyd mentioned, one of the one of the there's probably, th he mentioned three big things, um, and I'll cover them a little bit here as well. Um, but the ability to synchronize, input, uh, synchronize outputs based off of synchronized inputs is really important um, from a reliability and high availability point of view. So within the Media Live product uh, service as of about, uh, as of about September, um, if you provide two inputs, an input A and an input B, that are synchronized with timecode, the output from uh, Media Live and the two outputs that it provides will also be fully synchronized, so you can fail over between those two um, between those two data centers, between those two channels, if something uh, has happened. Um, and uh, another thing that uh, comes up pretty frequently when we talk about broadcast um, workflows are things like ad insertion. So Media Live has added the ability to either read in uh, on an input side, it can accept. Uh, a, tr a stream coming in that has ad markers. And then from there, it can insert the ad markers into the outputs. Or through an API call, you can, you can tell uh, Media Live where it should put ad markers into, into the streams. And uh, things like adding and removing graphics with API call. So if you want to include your channel logo bug or uh, things like this, that can all now be done as well. And each of, th each of these is really designed to, to bring the traditional broadcast encoder capabilities up into um, up into the uh, AWS cloud, and the the last one that, that Lloyd had mentioned was being able to switch a switch a source. So Media Live can now take multiple inputs 
and switch between them. So it can be multiple live inputs. It can be fi a live input with files, um, similar to, to the example of having a channel that starts with a pre-roll, goes to the main broadcast, has a, a failover, or a, uh, you know, the, this program has been interrupted um, file that you can just pull off of and start playing automatically. Um, and switch between these playlists, or switch between these sources um, with an API call. And what it allows you to do is to start building playlist capabilities um, in the cloud with this live encoder. So if you wanted to um, have a news channel where the majority of the day was um, pre-programmed material, it was all VOD content, all files, um, you can have that be part of your playlist. And then during the news hour, switch over to a live broadcast and then switch back to the file-based VOD sources again at the, at the end. Um, and these, these types of things, we think, really s start to, to move those kind of standard broadcast capabilities um, into, into the cloud. And then, of course, Media Live allows you to you know, set your, your ABR stack at kind of however you want and automatically takes care of, takes care of that work for you as well. Um, the, other, the next piece along this, this broadcast chain is Media Package. And so Media Package Again, similar to um, similar to Media Live, when you think about what is an, what does a cloud origin need to look like, there are a lot of challenges that that kind of go beyond the idea of just having an EC2 instance running um, and running an origin on it. It's it's much more complicated with um, when you start building in re resiliency. So Media Package also splits um, splits its workload across multiple AZs. So you have data center redundancy um, built in. Um, it again takes two inputs. So strangely enough, that's how many outputs Media Lives gives you. So those two things kind of fit right together. Um, and then once the content goes into um, Media Package, it gets stored, spread across the multiple data centers, um, across um, a storage and database buckets, and when when people start to make requests for content. It has the capability to auto scale its its egress fleet. So um, when when there is you know the the last five minutes of a of a football match and all of a sudden we start we start going into a tight um, a tight match or a tight situation, more people start logging in. They start watching this the uh, video. It comes up on social media. All of a sudden the number of viewers starts increasing, and you. The uh, media package has the ability to automatically scale up its resources so that you don't have to you don't have to worry about that um, where you would if you were um, kind of building your own EC2 origin type of solution, um, and it, it's able to do that with because it has a built-in origin shield and uh, cache um, providing reliable reliable performance so that when the CDNs ask for content, it's always there. And the second piece of that is um, the ability to automatically fail over between these inputs. So Media Package has multiple dual inputs. It has, uh, it has the input A, input B. And if there's a problem on one of those inputs, the, um, the input kind of gets set to the side, and the other one carries through so that there's a single known, um, known good output. Um, for a CDN or however the however the system is configured to to pull from, and um, there's a couple benefits of this. One is that your content is always available. Um, the second one is that it simplifies your player design. So today, a lot of times, the redundancy and reliability pieces of a live streaming workflow fall onto the player. The player has to make some decisions um, when it asks for content. It doesn't get the content. Then it has to have you know a, a fallback CDN list or um, additional logic built into the player, um, but that's not always it's not always feasible as you're building out um, media workflows that you can control the player. Frequently you can, um, but in some cases like smart TVs, unless you have a, a very large team, you may you may not be able to do that. And so this kind of highly available single endpoint allows you to. Um, work with simpler players and to, or to simplify your player design um, and, and uh, take advantage of that to give your viewers a, a better experience. So these are kind of 
um, within Media Live and uh, Media Package, some of the, the big changes that have, that have come through over the last couple of months, um, especially focused on that resiliency of, of a live stream and what that looks like. Um, and we'll see more, more changes coming through from CloudFront as well to, to add in uh, additional resiliency um, at the, the very edge of the network as well. And um, one, of the, one of the challenges that, that always comes up is how do you build this yourself? Um, we talk with lots of customers and they, they kind of fit into different categories. There's a set of customers that want to build everything um, themselves because each of these essentially are independent building blocks. And you can configure them each independently. You can put your own pieces in the middle of the workflow, at the beginning of the workflow, at the end of the workflow, um, and that will all work, that will all work fine. Um, but there's another group of people that's, that say, um, that's great, but how can I get started more quickly than doing each, all of these pieces by myself? And um, one of the solutions that AWS provides are um, cloud formation templates. So in this case, if you were to look up live streaming on AWS solution um, on the internet, what you'll find is the AWS solutions pages. And within those solutions pages, there is a cloud formation template that is a one-click deployment that spins, that spins up basically everything we see here so that it creates a media live, a media package, a cloud, uh, cloud front, connects them all together, includes the buckets and the um, um, includes the buckets and uh, also includes even things like uh, demonst um, sample source content. So it provides a file that allows you to just automatically get started. So you don't even have to get your stream running immediately. You can just take this sample file and use that as the source of your broadcast just to test out and make sure that everything's running. Um, in this um, from here, then you would then you would then go and add your live channel. So that means you supply an RTP or an RTMP or an HLS input into this, and then um, as this is the one end of the cloud form formation template, and the back end of the cloud formation template, you get an endpoint that you can then view on your phone, um, PC, or smart TV. So the goal here is to just to simplify the getting started phase of live streaming. Did I miss anything there? I don't think so. Um, so that's, that's basically our talk and how, how um, these media services are helping people move through their um, cloud transition, changing some of the ways that they're doing their broadcast and expanding and um, especially as they, they both mentioned the idea of taking um, special events where you may end up with 10 more channels than what you normally do and bringing those into the cloud. Those are uh, very straightforward use cases for things like this. So thank you, thank you for your time. Um, please fill out your evaluations and if you want to um, talk with us, please come up and uh, meet us up front.